we're gonna run trains today, guys. Last time we just like ran light locomotives, and that's only so exciting because I mean, well, no I've been here for, for 24 danger. hours firing up the goat. I don't know about you. I, actually, oh, I don't good, know. good man. Yeah, I, I came in at uh, 4 a.m. yesterday. How long would it take since. to fire up an engine if you were like you like had to go? Engine's got to be moving asap. Um, couple hours maybe hour and a half get a big fire like you, you take your time getting the fire built and then built up because you don't want to choke it right but once you've got a fire established you toss a forced draft on it with a fan on the stack or you hook a an, an airline from the shop or a steam line from the shop into the blower and then you just open that thing wide and just keep feeding it fuel and that is atrocious for the boiler. But, you know, back in the day when you had to make money and you had to have locomotives, I mean, if you didn't this have is, another one steamed get, up. You just got to get the, the temp up as fast as possible. But then obviously you're yeah. going to cause issues with, you know, temperature differentials throughout the steel. Yeah. And it's going to be cold I've heard, on one side and hot on the other and so on and so I've forth. I've heard and, stories of locomotives that got fired up as fast as they could just to make sure that, you know, they could get out on the road and fix whatever the problem was. And the safety valve's popping, but you could put your hand on the boiler sheet. That's how cold it was still. So it was just Which like, it gross. was basically just pressure only building up in the one spot. And like, well, see, so you'd have 200 PSI ish, whatever it runs at. Right. Uh, to get the safety lifting on the inside of the sheet. And then across the three quarters of an inch or five eighths of an inch of steel or whatever it is, uh, you go from that 200 degrees or uh, 200 PSI, 400 degrees ish Fahrenheit to you know 90 degrees fahrenheit ish like that temperature gradient which is atrocious for the steel i mean yeah i mean the it, would, boilers, it would kind of warp and stuff wouldn't it like you'd have boilers like... are only fixed at the front of the locomotive at the cylinder saddle that's the only place asterisk depending on the locomotive design most common locomotives are only fixed at the saddle and they sit on kind of skates or swing links at the back because the boiler gets almost an inch longer for larger locomotives when it gets up to that temperature and pressure because of the expansion of the steel. And the so and the inch so pushes into if the you cab, rush that, like it would it would push like towards you guys. Like all the yeah, it comes so towards all the, the cab. all the valves, all the like all. How do they deal with the fact that the hoses like there must be flexible hosing then, right? Like because it's all going to move. Well, so everything grows with the locomotive and the temp grows with the locomotive. So like you might have stuff that leaks when cold, but when it heats up, it seats up and it doesn't leak. Do you run into the issue where pipes like completely disconnect from like the temp difference? Like could you have a, a rivet like completely disconnect or something like that? Cause it's too hot. Probably and... not completely, but if you had a quick enough fire up, you, you would stress the bolts enough that you could start breaking stay bolts. And that, that has happened at rail. I mean, that's probably happened to every steam engine in existence at some point, uh, unless it's like a brand new build or something like that is just the name of the game. Sometimes if the railroad was trying to get out there and get these things fired up quick, particularly with the older style boilers, we talked about uh, rigid stays versus flexi stays a couple episodes ago. So the flexies can handle it better, but uh, the rigid ones, I mean, you're very, very likely to break those. What about modern diesels? Is it like turn a car key and then the thing goes? I mean, it's a little bit more than just turn a car key, but for all intents and purposes, yes. I mean, it's like, yeah. so do they have you, a starter flip. on them? Like all like an electric starter or is it actually some uh, sort it, of a crank it system? It depends. It depends. And this is actually a really fun topic that I'm glad you brought up. So there's the two manufacturers of locomotives primarily these days, EMD and GE. And, and while we talk about this, I, a couple episodes ago, I mentioned that GE bought Alco and I pissed off the Alco foamers. Rightfully so, I'm sorry, uh, I goofed. I didn't actually realize that GE did not buy Alco, but they were in a partnership briefly. Um, and so a lot of their designs were really similar because of the partnership and everything. And, and when I had heard about, uh, I'd worked on an Alco and it had an engine that looked just like a 7FDL on the GEs that I worked on. and. Uh, I, I made an assumption and I was wrong. So my apologies on that. But anyway, uh, two major manufacturers of uh, EMD and GE. GE does the smart thing, I think, and they use the alternator as the starter. They just run power through what they use as their alternator later, once the engine's running, and then that turns over the engine so you don't need Wait, any so extra parts. Wait, so alternator's like a big DC motor then? Yep. 
so you can run power through it, or you can use it as a as an alternator to generate power off. The exactly, rotation. it's just just like the traction motors and are too. What is it? Yeah. Is it it's chain driven then, or is it a big belt? It has to be a chain, right? Like, there's no way. No, so they they are or they're, they're not geared? directly coupled. There's a flex coupling. They're in line. Right. The alternator and the the actual engine. And so the crankshaft of the engine runs to a flex plate of some variety. It's different depending on which manufacturer, of course. Um, and then that flex plate is what bolts directly to the alternator. Are the engines, so the engine running straight into the motor, there, is there a gear reduction there? Is it just like big diesel nope. crankshaft one one. right in the motor? Crank, crankshaft, flexible coupling, boom, motor. done. Yep. That's it. Well, it's not a motor, but it's uh, well, yeah, it, the, the it's alternator. A, a yeah. giant D, well, it's, it's a giant DC rotor and stator, right? Like it would be the same. Well, yes, rotor and stator. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to put it. It's just, you know, that's what I'm calling a motor. But yeah, it's only a motor if it's, you know, going one way and it's a generator yes. if it goes the other way. If we're going to be electrical engineers, Heist, we should be well, electrical engineers. Well, it's... it the, Do the some nuance, of that black magic stuff. The, the nuance being that it's not actually a generator. It is an alternator because to actually generate power, it does need an excitation supplied to it right uh so there, there's a separate companion alternator in the case of ge's that d makes that happen and then in the case of emds they have a separate auxiliary generator that then supplies that excitation and then it's so it's big 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 diesel engine goes to big alternator which then yep. provides big amount of power to multiple electric motors which are then straight drive to the wheels Yes, yeah, there are there gear like reduction no gear from the motor reductions to the, anywhere or any of that stuff. There just, is a gear reduction from the motor to the wheels. There but is it's a fixed. It's a fixed gear ratio. You can't it change it. It is fixed, correct. And, and they're, they're designed differently for different applications, like passenger diesels have higher gearing than freight ones and stuff. So right. um, that's a thing. But the, the difference in starting comes with EMD, where EMD tends to have uh, a couple different styles. Some of the old stuff did start like the GEs, where they use the uh, the generator in that case because the ancient EMD stuff actually had giant generators, which got very inefficient very quickly, which is why they went to alternators anyway. Um, but most of the EMDs either have two, a pair of giant cat electric starters manufactured by Caterpillar these days, uh, turning a huge ring gear that is mounted to that flex plate we were talking about, or they have air start where they have a gigantic third main reservoir and that third main reservoir holds a ton of air that they just dump through a giant pneumatic motor that is then bolted to that same ring gear. Uh, and so the air start was always fun because it was an extra thing to lock out tag out because you needed to make sure that there was no air to prevent the engine from rotating. Uh, and also they were always fun because invariably you'd take them out to test them and you wouldn't have any air, and then yeah, you I was gonna say, wouldn't the, the air locomotive. bleed over time, and then you'd be stuck yes. with this? So what? You hook it up to an air compressor and let it. You hook it up. Theoretically, you're always next to another locomotive. You can always charge it if you're at a shop from some system. But we would always invariably forget because we would we'd only once in a blue moon get uh, get a locomotive with air start into the shop. So it was like right. okay. So the electric but, uh, starts. They must like locomotives. that must just have a massive like battery pack then. They have two huge 32 volt batteries. And they That's might be more than 32 volt because the the whole thing runs. Uh, the whole locomotive runs on 74 volts, so they must be different. So um, even even the big the, exact the thing, big but, drive motors run on 74 volts, but they must be a massive yeah. amperage. They're they're gigantic batteries. Uh, two of those car like two of those batteries. Um, in the locomotives, I mean, you need a forklift to put them in. They're huge. Um, right. They are shoot. If I had to guess. Um, one of those batteries is bigger than the V8 in my Pontiac. Yeah. And I have a 400 cubic inch yeah, I mean, V8 in it. I know, mean, it, power, they're huge. They're the size a, of a small pallet. Power is a pretty simple equation. I mean, wattage is equal to voltage times amperage. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's it's a pretty simple equation. One horsepower is what, 500 something watts? 600 something watts? I don't remember the 550, number. 550, I want to say, if right. I'm remembering so, things something right. Something like that, five, 600 ish. And so if you want to move something with a thousand horsepower, you need 550 kilowatts, which is on 74 volts, a holy buttload of amps to, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, AKA the, the, big fun, battery. the fun of these EMD locomotives comes in and the folly of the railroad 
uh, comes in with efficiencies and trying to make things better and save money. Right. A, a, a story as old as time. And so EMD built the locomotives and designed them to just be, you know, run and they're fired up and they're up because that was kind of what we did with steam engines. We just had them fired up and they would be up. And then when we would need to maintain them, we would take them down and they would be down. Right. Kind of binary. They don't like to start. <laughs> so one guys, of the most... Like, did, were there any locomotives back in the day, like, that had external starters at all? Or are all the modern locomotives, like, they're all internal starting mechanisms? Like, no one built a oh, locomotive well, so, where it's like... So the, the starters on these EMDs that I'm talking about are external starters. They are external running a giant ring gear that's outside the engine... Uh, you can right, see but them it's still like on the side of the each block. locomotive has it. Like I'm talking more like if you look at like aircraft. Sometimes there's aircraft where you have to hook it up to like an APU, uh, you know, an auxiliary power unit, which is like a whole other generator that fires up with a turbine before the actual main engine start. You oh, know what I mean? no, not that not that I know of. Um, you, we've definitely jumped started locomotives with other batteries, which is kind of the only equivalent thing I could think of. Right. But uh, yeah, that that would be like the only. So you never have to bring, like, an external generator up, hook it into the thing, and then, like, you know... No, not unless you were jumping a dead locomotive. Right, yeah, okay. Yeah, so the the folly of the railroad was uh, they they learned that diesel engines use lots of fuel, and the more that they sit idling, the more fuel they use. And Um. so they realized that they could save a lot of money if they would stop idling locomotives all the time. So So they they just turned them off and on? (laughs) No, they put an automatic engine start stop system on them called aess automatic engine start stop and if you had enough battery charge enough main reservoir pressure so enough air uh and the engine temp was high enough the locomotive would shut down automatically and then when one of those parameters fell out of spec it would automatically restart it and so you went for a locomotive would it check to make sure like the brakes were tied so that you're not shutting off you, that that is that is up to the uh, the locomotive engine being on or off has nothing to do with the brakes being set or not. That is up to the crew to properly secure their equipment, so, which is one of the big things the FRA looks for. What if for, you're like so. coasting down a hill? You could shut off the locomotive as you're coasting. Oh, it does check if um if you're moving or you're under power and all that stuff. No, it won't auto start then. If you're, oh, okay. if your reverser is thrown into forward or reverse it won't do it it's only if you're in neutral that's gotcha, my, gotcha. my apologies for assuming that uh, that would have been but what if you're in neutral ahead. going down a hill or does it have a sensor that says no no you're you in motion you should never be in neutral you should always be in a direction thrown but yeah, it, it well, can it never be in neutral too, when you're so driving a standard either. either but you know sometimes you got to do what you got to do you know what i mean yeah Just... well th- there's literally no reason to on a diesel locomotive because you have to have the reverser thrown for the dynamic brakes to work oh so... i see yeah. So you're going so down a, a hill with the reverser in forward and then yep. in a in a notch and then it's automatically throttling back because it's obviously not applying throttle to go down the hill. Yeah, so you, I mean you'd be in a, a notch on dynamics, which does run the engine harder, but right. um that would be that rather than uh, you know, the throttles in any notch or anything. But it'll try so- and provide power to the motors to slow them down rather than speed them up. Uh, so the power, the motors are generating power, which is what oh, slows the train down in dynamics. Like dynamic yeah, breaking, they, you turn I guess. them, you turn them into generators, right? Which then causes a huge resistive load, you know, just from generating power that right. slows the train down, and it's pretty impressive, particularly at speed. But anyway, the AESS system would shut the locomotive down and then cycle it as it needed to, and so invariably you end up with locomotives that start like 10, 12 times a day. And then all of a sudden, all the original EMD spec starters are just exploding all the time, and then locomotives would come in with dead starters. Always. That was, like, one of the most common failures we had was, oh, starters are dead, you know. Or the uh, the, the write-up would be, dead won't start. And then you'd look, and the, you'd put power to the starter, and nothing would happen. Or smoke would come out. Or, you know, uh, one of the things is wrong, and it's like, okay, well, uh, new starter time. And so Caterpillar developed... Uh, a high torque high cycle starter that helped alleviate the problem a lot but it's like oh this is a a new problem we've created for ourselves instead of saving money on fuel we're now spending money on new starters i understand as we get better technology gets quote unquote simpler but like a, a diesel locomotive by comparison to a steam locomotive seems so much easier even though, like, it's obviously not, but like, you know, right? It, it just seems like, oh, it's just a, it's just a big, a big car engine that, you know, well, a big truck engine that then runs a big generator, which then, 
you know, runs an electric motor like you've got, you know, anywhere. Like, easy peasy, you know? And then... Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really much more complicated, but like I you know just compared to like all the valves and time and I'm sure like there's a ton of that stuff on a diesel too. You just don't see it all because really it's just like I have throttle. Doesn't show I, it to you. Yeah. Yeah. I give you throttle and it just goes and that's fine. <laughs> you know, like it's there's there's a lot of fun uh, stuff that happens behind the scenes to make it happen, just like your car, right? Yeah. And and it's it's kind of like looking at a carbureted car versus a fuel injected car. I mean, that's not the same steam to diesel, but it's kind of that thought process of there we're adding more systems, making it more complex, but making it more user friendly. And and to that end, that is that is another big difference between steam and diesel that I haven't really talked about on the channel too much, which is troubleshooting and repairing things. It's it's much much similar and akin to the uh, the diesel locomotive will start a train it can't pull and the steam engine can pull a train it can't start. Right. Well, the same thing kind of applies to troubleshooting and fixing. You can't really troubleshoot what the hell's wrong with the diesel locomotive, but you can fix it really easily. And the steam locomotive will tell you exactly what's wrong, but it's going to be a lot of work to fix it. Yeah. <laughs> So it's the same kind of oddity where you'll be searching an electrical gremlin for days, different electricians. No one can figure out why this locomotive doesn't load, doesn't drive, or you turn it on and it starts loading. Like it starts trying to drive as soon as you turn it on. Like, and they all, they're all computer that? controlled now, right? Like they'd have to be everything is all the throttles and not, stuff. Not all of them. The more modern day ones, yes, but we still have plenty of stuff in service that's entirely relay logic. So it's just it's just like you put switch forward, I rev engine up regardless of consequences, basically. Yeah, and then when things short out and things break and relays fuse and get stuck, sometimes you have the fun one. Like we we had a our shop switcher ancient sw something i don't remember the the gn 3436 somebody look at it or not 3436 3606 sorry look it up if you want the details on what kind of locomotive it is but that was our shop switcher at inner bay and it, it failed the one day where as soon as you would turn it on you would put the knife switch in to to give battery power to everything it would start drawing like 800 amps to the traction motors trying to move it Oh, good. And so you'd, you'd close the knife switch and it would try and weld itself shut because of the amount of current that everything was going on. Um, and it was because it was modified to also work in a jog mode where you could run the motors without the um, the, the engine running so that we could move it in, and in and out of the shop without any fumes and stuff like that. So that was how we moved dead locomotives around. And something electronic broke real bad and that was a whole thing. So, yeah. Good luck troubleshooting that and uh you know and then you fix it it's just one part and four bolts and boom done so con um i've made it to another industry and i see you've appeared on my tender and we haven't even said what we're doing this episode at all we, we just haven't talked trains. i thought we i thought we did no we didn't oh People i don't moved know the plank cars at the smelter so the plank right. cars are with the class 48 over there in the smelter line um we're gonna go to the iron mine to pick up some iron because we have some iron and we need to bring the helper back because you know we brought it to the roundhouse for the photo op and now it's gonna yep. go back so, so we've just been shoving it everywhere because yeah. I wanted to watch the gears melt. Because that makes sense. So we're just going to bring it to the iron mine and, uh, and you know, pick up some iron while we're at it. And then bring the iron to the smelter. We'll leave the hoppers here because we have space for it. And we'll bring the plank cars back to the hump yard where they belong. Because, you know, there's also an extra log car at the... Um, <laughs> At the buy area, so I didn't. Point, I didn't even remember to look for it when I was driving. Yeah, by. at some point in time, I, 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 if if my buy command went through it last episode, I don't know. I was kind of like frantically clicking buttons. It might not have gone through. I'm not exactly sure. So how often? We talk about the big stack. The point of the big stack is to cash ash and like sparks and stuff. Right. <coughs> Sorry, just dying. Need to drink some water. It's important to hydrate, it's, kids. It's fine. Hydrate before you dehydrate, everyone. So what happens when we talk for two hours and forget to drink water right um so how many cases do you know in the history where locomotives have burned down forests oh god because they just spewed a bunch of crap and lit a forest on fire is that is there any uh, like major I incidents mean, there, that come to uh, mind there's there, there there's no end to to like possibilities of that or or that sort of scenario happening um, you know, like most recently, there was a really recent one that um, the the court ended up ruling that it was the Drango and Silverton's fault, if I'm remembering right. 
Uh, but the 416 fire in, in Colorado that was a really nasty wildfire a couple years ago got blamed on the railroad. And, and whether it was the railroad or not, I don't think anyone will ever truly know. But uh, the coal burning engines do toss out hot cinders and they have and can start fires. I've had a, at the museum, we've had the 20 start four fires in one lap one day during Polar Express. Just and it was right like at the, the brush that you guys have. The little leaves in the gauge, something falls out the ash pan, sets the leaves on fire. It's not a big fire. They burn out super quick, but like you get the right mix of Paris conditions bring their and kids stuff by, and... their kid gets caught on fire. You just, you know. <laughs> you know, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. So, I mean, it, it, it's just kind of the nature of you, you're operating a mechanically forced campfire with, you know, coal or wood or whatever it is, you know, and it puts out embers and, and there's definitely times so there's in history still where wildfires no, like, have been started that way. There's no foolproof way to catch embers. Like, they all use, like, various screening methods and things like you that. Can, you can like... try a lot of things and the Durango and Silverton, to their credit, tried a lot of things to try and mitigate it. I mean, so the, the K36s that they're running had a cyclone front end so they had a special front end device in the smoke box that causes the exhaust to spin which means it's less likely for the cinders to fly out while hot because they spend that's more how time your hoover vacuum the filters flight. out dust <laughs> right it's true they use a cyclone and then all the dust goes to the outside because of you know centripetal force so i'm assuming they exactly. use the same... it's, it's kind of like that but you still want to eject the cinders so you don't have to clean out the smoke box they just spend more time in the stack because of so the they go they, they burn out basically they and burn out just... before they go out is the thought but when you've got a locomotive working tonnage i mean it's got a significant amount of exhaust pressure and that's a, a whole thing and um so th that wasn't enough so they added spark arresters on top of the stack as well because the Rio Grande when they added those uh, uh, Anderson front ends the cyclone front ends they took the spark arresters off because they didn't need them and the, the forests were managed differently in the industrial era and there was less chance of sorts of things like that so uh, you know less chance of wildfire so it, it never really caused too big of a problem for the railroad but anyway these days with the different way things were and the, the way that trees and vegetation had grown and everything um, made it more likely, right? Uh, so they added the spark arrester, and then they added a stack sprayer. They added a water pipe around the top of the spark arrester that would spray a mist of water at the cinders like, leaving like to try and put them out. water from the tender. Water from the boiler, I think it was a uh, valve controlled, so it was hot water, but it so would, it would you come know, out and flash the water the steam and, then. Yeah, it flashed to flash from. Uh, I mean, it would flash to steam, but if. I'm pretty sure that it like it would condense really quick too because it was a, a, out of a small hole so it made a fine mist of water basically really hot water but water nonetheless right and then that would theoretically put out and then they followed the train with track patrolmen on a speeder that had water and a, and a hose and everything and fire extinguishers to try and put anything out if it came up and uh, and they still, you know, presumably as the, the court ruled that, yes, they caused the fire. And again, we, we will never know. Um, but that's part of the reason why they've converted their engines to oil was to mitigate the chance of any more fires. And so they're, they're still running steam, but they burn oil instead of coal now. Right. And the oil has no like it's got no ash or cinder, I guess, or any, yeah, it's any, not shooting any particulate. Yeah, there's, no particulate there's still a chance flaming. you still have fire and there's still a chance that something gets ejected out the stack because they do have to sand flues and that sends little particles out to get rid of the grime and everything right. there's chances that something like a small piece of fire brick could wear off and break off and be hot and glowing when it gets sanded like there is possibility but it is significantly less than a coal burner what about um i got a question asking about electric steam engines the the swiss had them as far as i know they had like a, a steam engine with a panograph that went to an overhead wire and where the heck a bunch of resistive get, so they got power elements. power to heat the steam from where because you can't just generate power like you can't you can't use the steam pressure to run a turbine generate, like it's a net negative you know what i mean like the power yeah, has to exactly. come from somewhere so it was a, an overhead catenary wire with a panograph that runs to it like it's an electric oh, oh like it was, sorry it was like an over like a, it was a steam locomotive that ran off of like an electric wire built over the tracks yeah. they, they tried it as an experiment and apparently it was successful but like they didn't deem it necessary is what i've heard someone in the comments will, will have the whole story i'm sure but that's so weird 
Yeah. At Very that point, strange. like if you're gonna run a whole electric wire for a steam, why would you just run a electric motor on the train? I I don't know why that was a thing. Because why I would really you be don't. like, hey, let's tug around all this water weight just to heat it up, which is like super inefficient, by the way, because heating everything sucks. And you know that, that you know what I mean? Like that doesn't make that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It doesn't sense. make a ton of sense, no, does it? That's like the universal heat equation, you know? Like, heat is the most useless form of energy because you can't do anything with heat energy. You can only do stuff with the difference in heat. Right. right. Like, that, that's the, the magic of it. For example, here's the, the prime example. If you had a steam boiler running at, like, 1,200 degrees or whatever the heck it runs at on, like, the surface of Venus, which is also 1,200 degrees, it would not produce nearly the energy it does on Earth, because thermodynamics is a magical thing. You know, I've never thought about that, because I've never thought about railroading on other planets, but thank you for putting that thought in my head, Tom. It's true. Thermodynamics, right? It, it's always delta delta temperature, right? It's the difference in temperature. So if your steam right. was the same temperature as the outside air, or the same, you know, value on the PT curve, pressure and temperature, right? It wouldn't do anything. It wouldn't actually move the piston, because there's no difference. Right. How stupid That's... is that? And everyone's going to be like, no, no, you're totally wrong. It's, it's like, no, thermodynamics is like the weirdest mind-bending math ever and science. But it's true. It's like temperature is actually useless unless there's a difference between the two points. That's how it all creates right. energy. The, the engine has to be, the boiler it has, has to, to expel be the gas somewhere. than ambient. Yeah. yeah. If it's all the same, it won't do anything, as dumb as that sounds. Yeah, well, I mean, technically, you wouldn't have liquid water, and you wouldn't be able to have a, like, that, that wouldn't be a thing anyways. Uh, yeah, I, on know, Venus. I know, If we're but, getting, but... if we're going to get into semantics, but yes, your, your point about the delta T is correct. Yeah. Yeah. So it just seems silly to me to tow around all this water weight just to heat it up, just to cool it down, just to power a thing when... Yeah, con, con, con. You know. But it goes chuff, chuff, and it also right. goes... And, and it you also said it goes... was the Swedes, right? The Swedish that, that did I... it? I think it was the Swiss. Oh, it was the Swiss? But oh, okay. I'm not 100% certain. But they also go... Right. All right. Dunk. Yeah, no, it's not far enough. You gotta, you gotta, um... All right, well, uh, then you get out the way, and I'll run around the train then. Yeah, true. And the five fingers came back from the heavens. And... I mean, you, you gotta go down the hill, don't you? Oh, yeah, right. I gotta go down the hill. And the five fingers drive down the hill. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on a minute. My bad. I'm, I'm so used to not being the helper. Hold on. There we go. Don't... Oh, wait. No, I'm going to flip this. Guys, don't worry about it. It's the... Um, I, I saw Heist did a video where he was uh, playing with model trains, and uh, he couldn't get his train moving, so he... Uh, the 5 0 came down yeah. from uh, from heaven, yes. Yeah, and it uh, it moved the train. It was wonderful. I will see you later, sir. Uh, later. Don't don't derail on the way down, though. Come. Don't do oh, it. I, don't worry. You'll be able to see my black smoke for miles. It'll be fine. <laughs> much where's con somewhere in the valley that yeah. was black couldn't couldn't tell you okay well hey that's a that's a loaded train yeah it's good should make some money eight eight iron cars we of course don't have any cordwood so you know yeah <laughs> we won't make any more products yet we'll have to do another cordwood yeah, run normal so. normal things no cordwood at the smelter go figure that's uh that's just tuesday man yeah that's just a normal day yeah honestly oh yeah, wow so yeah con... your uh your bar is actually disconnected that's yeah it's, it's a little silly but, right. you, you know, Con, remember what happened last time we tried to go downhill with a loaded train? Yeah, but I'm going to be your brake man this time. You just yeah, worry about, you just uh, stay in the UI because client-side Mario is really bad. And, uh... Client-side Mario is really bad. <laughs> I'm just going to 100% brake on the first car already. That's, uh, that's probably smart. Yeah. I'm going to pull against it a little bit. You can pull against it. You'll be fine. See, this would be easier if we had air brakes, right? And we could just tie all the cars together. Yeah, and then you just set a setting in the cab and then the train yeah. would just be slow and, and then you put your great. feet up take a nap wait till you get to the bottom of the hill <laughs> pretty much you know <laughs> so some days on some railroads i mean that's the thing that happens there's a there's a great story from the old grand the rio grand where uh <laughs> tail end crew riding in the caboose conductor brakeman you know sitting there doing their paperwork trains slowing down whatever and train comes to a stop in the middle of nowhere no whistles no nothing what the hell? So they walk up to the head end of the train. Engineer's asleep. Fireman's asleep. Locomotive's sitting there with, like, you know, half boiler pressure. It finally sitting there with, you know, the Johnson bars kicked forward. The throttle's, you know, wide open. And uh, the engine ran out of steam. You know, it just equalized against the hill and was just sitting there like, yep, can't move anymore. Amazing. 
<laughs> it's like, bruh, wake up. <laughs> we got places to be, literally. So what happens if you're driving a train, let's say, across the country, and it's like, uh, you know, we, we live in a big country. You're going from east to west. It's like a three or four day trip, right? Like Lots of crews, yeah. They just pass the... Because you're not going to be able to park, let's say, like a two or three kilometer long train just on a line somewhere. Like, you'll have to keep yeah, it moving. Yeah, you can. Big sidings. Oh, there are big sidings. Where you there just there park are big sidings. You, you can. I mean, some sidings are not... Or are too big for uh, for the train to be part, or too, the trains are too big for the sidings rather. That does happen, but uh, there are places to stop the train, spot the train, not block things. But the the reality of it is, your crews are trained for a certain stretch of track, right? And so you know your subdivision or the couple subdivisions you work on out of Denver. You know how to go north out of Denver, west out of Denver, east out of Denver. So you know all of the ways the railroad runs, you know to the next big terminal, and that's what you know. So you're and just handing you off run... trains all the time anyway, then. Yeah. The, the, one crew does not take a train across the whole destination unless it's a short local these right. days. It's all about knowing your territory. You, you so have to know if you're the like an you're engineer, you don't have like one locomotive that you're attached to and you're like, this is my locomotive. Oh, God, there are no. many others like it. That, this one is back mine. Back in the day, in the 1800s, yes. You, but you had I one mean, locomotive and that was your locomotive and like 1900 onwards and 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 that date's not a, a hard 1900 it's somewhere late 1800s early 1900s the railroads made the change to like pools of power and things right. where you got assigned a thing but back in the early the early days of railroading and you read the stories in the in the books about the old days on the Denver and Rio Grande uh yeah, I mean, if the guys talk about that was my engine. The 402 was my engine. Yeah. And, you know, you, they were taking don't care touch of it my the best engine. they could. And don't touch my engine. Don't break my engine. They would try and steal more oil or make new oil, each engineer, to try and keep their engine in the best shape they could. And, and like, there's stories in Little Engines and Big Men talking about, oh, that time a snow slide came and knocked my engine down the mountain and it had to go to Salida for repairs for, for six months and I was stuck with this piece of crap while it was getting repaired. Yeah, it's like and the rental car, you know? Nobody likes exactly. the rental car. And so there was, it was in this era when these engines were shiny and pretty. But it's the, the, crazy the engineer is, right is the one who owns the engine. Yes. What about the firemen? Is that firemen are just universal? Are they like golf caddies? Fuck. You just kind of like... They, they kind of are, this actually, is your, yeah. This is your fireman for the day. His name is Billy. He's got six years' experience as a fireman, you know? And then you're usually, like, oh, man, I wish I had usually, Tiger Woods fireman from three days ago, you know? It's like... Usually they would be assigned, like, a bid job. Like, you bid onto the... Uh, the Gunnison job, or you, you, that's, that's not one of them, but whatever. You bid onto this branch line job, this switch job, this passenger train job, uh, and the engineer and, condu and conductor and fireman and everybody would kind of be assigned together. So you typically work with the same crew, although it was much easier to rotate and change firemen versus changing engineers because the engineer was really with their locomotive, uh, right. unless, you know, and then conductors were, or nobody things, cares so. about conductors, they just kind of come and go. No, so, I mean, they were all assigned, like, jobs as crews together. So you were the conductor on the, the San Juan passenger train, or you were the conductor on this whatever coal job or this et cetera industry job. And, like, that was the bid job, and that was your job. And it, and it left town this day, uh, these many days a week, and that was the way it works. And you were a team together until someone hired out to a different spot, got fired, died, whatever, you know? Got got killed by the natives that were robbing your train. Well, I mean that's probably in really rare cases, but I'm sure there's times when that happened. <laughs> so what happens if like the train crew is in the middle of nowhere and like like middle of nowhere, like 10, 15, 20 miles from any sort of people, and there's no telegraph office or anything like that, and they were the only train scheduled for that line of track, so nobody's coming, and, like, something critical broke on their steam engine. Are they just walking 10, 15 miles to... Fix it or walk. That's pretty much and it. Dudes, dudes got pretty ingenious at getting stuff over the road. I mean, you would be surprised, like, oh, we, we broke XYZ. Okay, run it on one side. You broke a piston on the one side? Okay. What, they'd Find run the whole to... steam train on the other side only and just kind of, like, hobble their way back? Get the engine back, try and get the cars in a siding, 
you, you broke a rod on one side. Okay, well, undo the other rod on the other side so that you're not running it as a, a 270. You know, make it a 2260. <laughs> oh my God. And then, and then, you know, drag it into town. See if you could fix it. Some of the nuts are the same size rod to rod. Like, you need to steal one from somewhere else to, to make it so that you can make power happen. Do it. Do whatever you can. That's why they're engineers. Right. Fix it. Make it happen. Get across the road, you know, because you're not going to get to sleep, you know, or you're walking. And uh, that would suck. So, but. All right, I'm going to throw towards, the switch for you. Yeah, get, get the switch and then we'll, we'll come unload this here. The um, in the later days, they got uh, phone booths pretty regularly placed uh, and telegraph line, you know, telegraph booths pretty regularly placed. So that became less and less of an issue. But uh, definitely, definitely times in history where that happened and you, you had to fix it and take care of yourself and get the train back moving again. See, I, I still wonder, I, I know there's uh, human history, human behavior, as much as we like to think we've evolved as a species, we really haven't. And uh, right. I like to think that back in the 1900s, you know, the steam days, there was definitely some guy, right, that was like, you know, on any given railroad, there would have been, let's say you're talking like, the you know, the Denver Rio Grande or whatever, right? There would have been some guy that, like, some employee, some engineer that just had the bad reputation of always wrecking something. You know what I mean? Wouldn't oh, be, I'm sure. Wouldn't it be great to interview that guy? Right. <laughs> who's, be like, who's the bad guy? Who's, yeah, who's bad luck? Here's the guy who just, no matter what job he's on, something goes wrong, and we just don't know why. But, like, that, that's... Uh, that, is, that is my friend Leighton, who we yeah. all know and love on the channel. Oh, perfect. Uh, and him in photo charters. He has been... The, we, we couldn't believe it. We, we went on the photo charter at the Dragon on Silverton this weekend, this past weekend, and the only thing that broke was a, a valve shook open on the tender, and the tender started to leak water, and and they, oh, crap. they fixed it, like, switch. super easy. Yeah, yeah, that one. Uh, I'll pull ahead. It's yeah, fine. Yeah, I'm not going to risk this. Yeah, don't, don't, don't throw us. We're, we're Kenosha-free right now, Con. All right, here we go. But, uh, yeah, Leighton, Leighton's go. been a part of photo charters where, like, a locomotive blew its cylinder head off. Um, the blast pipe fell apart in a locomotive. The blower pipe fell apart in another one. Like he is, he has experienced many cursed charters. So we uh, we give him a little a gentle ribbing for that. I love how the coal pile can support a thousand, and it's like you never see it move. And I've never even seen it above a hundred. Right. But I've like, seen some guys have it full, and it's a decent sized pile when it's full. But it's like. You have to How run a hundred cars of coal. Hundred like, cars that's a of, lot of, of iron ore. Yeah. yeah, or iron ore. Sorry, yeah. But the coal pile at the the ironworks, same thing. It's a thousand. It's a lot of material. And then on top of that, you it need really all the is. lumber and planks getting up the other way to get that material in the first place. So it's just. It's a lot of train to move. Yep. Good thing we got that two percent line though. I'm gonna fix up. Yep, we're gonna get some 300 meter beads on man. it, and then we'll be able to really uh, move some, some big freight, you know? If I'm a switchman when you're uh, running a locomotive, you're gonna just slow down, wait for me to run up ahead, flick the switch, and then, like, how long would it take me to tie a switch, though? Because you have to hand crank it over, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah, so you move the switch by hand, but we wouldn't let, let you run up front. The, uh, the old saying is a good railroader is a lazy railroader. We would, you would ride on the engine with us, we'd pull up to the switch, you'd tell us to stop stop shy of the switch as close as we can get you and then you'd get off only walk the short distance that you needed to oh so they would full out stop the whole train and just start it back up from dead again well back in the day they probably would have got on off and on moving equipment but they would have gotten you closer so you wouldn't have to run because running on ballast sucks walking on ballast sucks there's stuff to trip over there's ties right. that's slippery ballast is hard on your feet and doing that for years and years like if you can avoid it it's really encouraged to try and avoid it and ride everywhere you can. But to them, it's it's they don't really care to have to start the whole train's momentum up again and rebuild all that. And just well, whatever. I mean, you, you do and you don't. I mean, if you got to go a different route, you got to throw the switch. You got to throw the switch, and before you have computerized, you know, switches and things that can be thrown remotely, you know, somebody's got to get out and do it. So you either stop or you slow down enough that you get off and you run out ahead and throw the switch and. And then we keep going, but that, that's kind of uncommon because if you fumble the lock, then, well, guess what? We have to back the whole train up, and right. rather than start it extra once, you're starting it extra three times or two times. So, so. on uh, modern-day locomotives, is uh, 
is that like the automatic switching you were saying like there's obviously like automatic switching stuff on modern day locomotives do they um is that like something that the the operator the, the engineer of the train has to be like hey i want to switch this switch and then it will remotely switch or is it all just like done automatically to a schedule or their transponders on the train like how does it know where to put each train it depends so oh, when we're talking like freight railroads and stuff uh you it's all dispatch it's what's called centralized traffic control where in the case of bnsf there is a football stadium american football stadium sized room in fort worth texas where all of the dispatchers save for like a handful of special cases uh all live and you call dispatch and say hey we need rooted into here and dispatch has the schedule and knows where the trains are going and they're, they're the only ones that control time, all the switches they're the ones that do it all unless there's a problem with the switch and then train crew or, or uh, the MOW folks need to take care of it manually. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. And, it's all remote. Uh, it's literally like they're basically playing with a giant train set from... Oh, yeah, like, exactly. From exactly. Like halfway across the country or whatever. That's that's the whole fun of it. So uh, the, the difference with like transponders and stuff like you're talking, that's actually in transit applications. So I designed signals for transit for a while uh, out of Seattle Sound Transit. And the way that those work is that they have a loop, an, uh, an actual loop of wire in the track that uh, is called a TWC loop. And it looks like a number eight. So it's actually two crossed over loops of wire. And it transmits a 19 bit message between the train and the wayside. TWC stands for train with wayside communications, which is an extra w but whatever who cares so that um, wire like is connected all the way back to some central hub location it's connected back to the nearest signal bungalow right. for that location so if you you get to an interlocking say you get to a, a junction point and your options are to go to seattle or bellevue which will be a thing at some point but anyways and you get to the junction and your train is programmed and your train tells the wayside hey I am train XYZ, I am car XYZ in lead position. Uh, my destination is this destination. Please route the switches and clear the route this way. And then the signal system makes that happen and it makes it happen while they're going 55 miles an hour. So the train never has to stop, switches automatically route, signals automatically clear, assuming that it allows them to. I'm Sometimes assuming signals still have but... like the manual indicators on top so that you can look at them from a distance and see what direction it's lined to. Uh, they're not manual indicators, but they're LED. They're, oh, okay. They, they, gotcha. It, and again, it depends on the application. Like on the, the big freight railroad, you'll have a green signal for proceed straight. So you might have a, a different aspect of flashing green or flashing yellow or, or a yellow or any various thing to say, oh, you're going to turn. And then in transit, we have weird signals that are bars. And if you have a white bar that's vertical, it says you're going straight and you're cleared straight. Or you have a slanted white bar that says you're turning left. So what about um, like what happens if you've got like a power outage and the signal house doesn't have power? They have battery backup. What and happens if your battery hookups. backup runs out? They have hookups for backup generators. And if and if you get past that, you're not running trains. Wow, okay. And particularly in transit, because tr transit is electrified. So right. if you don't have power, like, at the end of the day, you're going to run out of traction power before you, you know, need to be able to do anything else. Right. Uh, and the freight railroad, I mean, you can run those things on battery backup forever because it's just 12-volt DC. It's not anything rocket science. For the signals. Basically hook a car battery up to it, you know? Um, and they have the same thing. They have some battery backup for a certain amount of time, and, and they're ready for a certain amount of switch moves with electric switches, and, and they can have the signals run for so long. But at the end of the day, if you lose power, a dark signal is a red signal. It means stop. Well, that's unfortunate. And then that would be enforced by PTC on the modern day railroad. Red equals dark. There's no power. PTC can't talk. PTC says, ah, and then stops the train. There's your log car, Con. There it is. Yeah, it is. Oh, look at that. Perfect. Unnamed log car. Wonderful. Well, I mean, I think the, the starter ones we had were all unnamed, too. Yeah, so it's no, it's perfect. It'll just fit right in with the group. Fits right in. And now we just have a weird number of them. So thanks. Thanks for that. All right. All right well, perfect. Another mission so, accomplished. We have... Back, uh, oh, yeah. Back I'm up at to... the hump yard. We got to gotta stick the cars in the hump. But oh, you want to hump? Sure, we can hump. Uh, oh. We don't have an engine on the lead track. We don't. So we're going to have to run around all the way and it'll be a yeah. whole thing.
Well, we might as well save that for next time, because we're going to need to probably bring cordwood and or planks, and or we might just end up bringing these again. Uh, yeah. So I guess we'll figure that out, but um, yeah. as Khan always said, let us know what you think in the comments down below. Yeah, really no, fast. that's exactly right, how I say it, that, and we'll see you all next time. Goes. Yeah. Yep. Bye. Just, just like that. Perfect. Yep. 10 out of 10.